Jeremy, you gonna get us started? Sure, let's get started if y'all want to. Uh, others come in, we'll just let them go ahead and come in, that sort of thing. Uh, it's good to see everybody this evening. Um, basically, we're gonna talk about uh, wildlife food plots, but uh, I'm gonna back up a little bit. I'm gonna, I'm gonna talk a little bit about uh, uh, soil, soil testing for wildlife food plots, but I'm gonna back up a little bit. Um, and talk about uh, pretty much wildlife habitat. Wildlife habitat. Uh, uh, what I tell the when I talk in my hunter ed in my hunter ed courses, uh, I pretty much just uh, talk about uh, wildlife habitat. And wildlife habitat is something that's uh, providing you're providing food, water, cover, and space. So basically, when you're when you're talking about attracting wildlife, you need to talk about that. And, and hopefully, I'm not uh, uh, crowding Shad out on some of his participation, but you know, one of the things is when you're when you're creating a wildlife habitat or you're creating a, uh, a food plot, you know, you may get some some critters in there that you don't necessarily want. But uh, um, glad to have everybody tonight. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen, and uh, we'll get started. Shad, are you seeing that soil testing? Uh. Should say soil testing for wildlife food plots. Are we still seeing? Uh, I'm still seeing uh, Emerson's. Okay, we may have to stop Emerson's. Emerson, you may okay. have to go to the top of your screen and hit stop share. Oh wait a minute, it is showing. Oh. It's showing. Is it there? Okay. Yep. Okay. <clears throat> All right. Uh, so we're going to talk a little bit about soil testing. This is kind of the simple stuff, but it's very important when you start to uh, to put these together. Uh, these food plots together that you start to look at a soil test. Um, that's that's something that uh, we would definitely recommend for you. So what is soil testing? It's basically a, a special chemical analysis that provides a guideline for lime and fertilizer needs of the soil. Uh, so in, uh, in other words, it's what uh, what you're putting in that soil uh, or what's in that soil uh, already and then also what else does it need? What does that soil need? So it's gonna that soil test is going to give that. Uh, there are going to be several things in there with, that mentions the University of Kentucky, but uh, you can also get this to fill uh, through Virginia Tech. So we provide this service uh, via your extension offices. So why soil test? So one, there's because there's different soil types, there's different fields and often areas within the same field vary in the availability of the nutrients of the plant. Also, a field or a food plot may even have varying levels of nutrients. Uh, soil testing is definitely the best way to identify those differences and it allows you to adjust those liming and fertilization practices. A lot of times we get calls uh, in our offices, Shad, Phil, and I, we get calls uh, in our offices that say, uh, you know, what, what do I need to put on for fertilizer? You know, what, what do you recommend? Or uh, do I need to lime? And a lot of people are even, even liming maybe whether it be uh, food plots or whether it be uh, uh, yards or gardens, and they don't even they don't even need the lime, or they're put too much fertilization down. So this soil test is going to give you what you need to put down uh, for um, uh, for the fertilization of the lime. Also, you need to get the most of your uh, most from your fertilized fertilizer. There's for there's no waste at all, and uh, that's what you want. More bang for the buck. That way you're not wasting any money on fertilizer or lime. <clears throat> a really good example is this chart here got from Mississippi State University. If you'll notice a soil acidity of 6.0 pH, uh, which is a little low, you want it closer to seven. Basically, if you'll look at it on the right hand side is you're basically losing 20% of your fertilizer. So uh, if you're losing 20% of your fertilizer, if, you're, if you put down a hundred pound, a fertilizer, basically you're losing 20 pounds. So however much that uh, that fertilizer costs, you can you can take 20% of it that you're just throwing it away. So if you'll look down here at the 7, 7.0 pH, uh, the nitrogen uptake, the phosphorus, uh, phosphate uh, uptake, uptake of potash to the potassium is 100%. So you're not wasting any fertilizer by pulling that uh, soil acidity up. So we need to look at that, the soil acidity which is your pH, and also uh, that, that's going to give us an idea on what the fertilizer to put down. That way you're not wasting anything. 
<clears throat> so a little bit, how does this testing work? Well, you're gonna collect those soil samples, you're gonna take them to your extension office and uh, all the necessary information you need to give for those. Uh, for instance, uh, is, is it a new food plot? Uh, you, you may even wanna give the type of grass that you're, that, or the legume that you're putting in the food plot. Have you ever put any previous fertilizers on it? Any previous limes, like within the last year? Is it a shady area? Is it a sunny area? So you wanna give those, uh, th that information to those. Then those samples are sent off uh, to University of Kentucky or Virginia Tech if you're on the Virginia side of the line. So uh, uh, they're gonna be sent off for testing. And in Kentucky right now, these samples are actually running about one and a half weeks uh, uh, turnaround time on those. <clears throat> Information's then sent back uh, to the extension office and a recommendation is gonna be sent to the landowner, the email, mail, whatever, uh, with the guidelines for the uh, lime fertilizer rates. So what tests are made? Basically, we're looking at for routine test or is the pH and your N, P, and K, nitrogen, uh, uh, phosphorus, and potassium. Basically, that's what's on the bag of fertilizer. A bag of fertilizer that says 10, 10, 10 is basically 10% nitrogen, 10% uh, phosphorus, 10% potassium. So you're gonna get that information back. The results are gonna be returned to the landowner in the amount per acre or amount per 100 or 1,000 square foot. Basically, on a food plot, it's gonna either be amount per, per acre or a uh, thousand square foot. For instance, it may say uh, you need to put 10, 10, 10 fertilizer at uh, 20 pound per thousand square foot. <clears throat> so the liming rate and the type of fertilizer will be recommended, like I mentioned earlier, four pound to 10, 10, 10 per thousand square foot. So collecting these things. Samples can be collected year round, but fall or spring's the best. Uh, so right now is a good time to start collecting these. If you're looking at putting a uh, a, uh, a uh, food plot in with it, you know, even a garden. Uh, I'm going to throw a garden out there. I'm going to throw lawns. I'm going to throw hay fields, pasture fields out there. We talked about that uh, a couple of weeks ago. But basically, right now, you need to take, uh, take those soil tests. Uh, fall sampling, they'll return a faster uh, results. But all, oftentimes, uh, unless it was like a year before last or it was wet, uh, you're going to have a lower pH and lower potassium levels when conditions are dry. Now, we had a drought last year, and so those uh, pH and, uh, and potassium levels can be low when the uh, conditions are dry. <clears throat> so some tools are needed. Hey, a soil probe, soil auger, garden trowel, spade, a knife needed to make a field sample. You're just going to go out there and try to make a field sample. Uh, use a clean, dry plastic bucket to collect and mix samples. Do not use galvanized or rubber because they can contaminate that sample with zinc. And so it's gonna, it, it could read off there, uh, give an off reading, but uh, something like that works great. Plastic bucket, uh, I'm sure we all got a plastic bucket around somewhere <clears throat> to collect and make the samples. <clears throat> the soil samples uh, bags are available from the county extension offices. So you can see the kind of tools you need, nothing special. The two on the, two on the ends, those are more special, those are augers or probes, you can use a, uh, just a regular shovel, a trowel, whatever uh, works. So collecting those samples, collect cores rambly, randomly from each area. So if you're gonna put this uh, plot in on an area that's say 20 by 20 uh, food plots, go and uh, visually collect or go, you know, visualize it, go out there and collect random samples from uh, all over that. Uh, just make sure that you, you collect them in, uh, in several different locations. For instance, soil collection depth should be uh, in tilled areas, uh, six to eight inches. And I know we're in a mountainous terrain. A lot of times, for instance, on Pine Mountain, you're doing good if you can get three to four inches of soil. Uh, but in tilled areas, if, if it's an area that you've tilled, uh, try to get that six to eight inches depth. Uh, if it's a non or reduced tilled area, try to get three to four inches. Turf areas, three to four inches. So after you've collected these in several different locations, what you'll need to do is um, put them in your bucket <coughs> and, uh, <coughs> excuse me, and uh, crush that soil material and mix the sample th thoroughly. Now, also what you're gonna do is you're gonna have to allow that sample to air dry in an open space, free from contaminations. 
uh, just spread it out on, on paper plates, spread it out on newspaper. Uh, you can even spread it out, say, on a garbage bag or something like that. Um, do not dry the sample in an oven or at a high temperature because this could give a false reading. I always give an example here. I had a gentleman to come in the office one year <clears throat> and he had a uh, soil sample for a food plot. And uh, we sent it off and uh, it needed a, lot of, needed a lot of lime, a lot of lime. And uh, so got, got it back. He went out, he applied, the, he applied the fertilizer, he applied the lime, everything did great. And I told him to come back the next year because it needed so much lime to see what it looked like so we could get another soil sample on it. Well, we, we took care of it, we sent it in, and the second year, and we got the results back, I sent it to him, and he, come, he, he comes by, by the office a few days later and he says, hey, something's wrong here. My soil sample here is showing that the soil is actually worse than what it was the first time. And I said, really? And so we started, I started quizzing him on different things, asking him different questions of what it could be. And I found out he literally took the, uh, took the soil sample from the second, the second year and dried it in an oven. And he took it in the oven, just put it in the oven, try to get it dried quicker. And what he did is he literally cooked the soil. So he cooked the soil and all the nutrients were uh, basically taken out of the soil sample, thus giving a false reading. So we tried it again. The third time, and, and it actually uh, had a better soil, soil test the following year uh, for his food plot. So when properly dried, it takes one to two days. Depends on the soil moisture. As wet as it's been lately, it may take up to three days. Then you're going to take that to the, uh, your uh, extension office and provide them with the necessary information about your food plot, like I mentioned earlier. Now, one of the things that I recommend to people is when they bring that, that soil sample in, is to bring in uh, is to literally bring in a quart. I asked for a quart. Now, um, a quart's a, uh, basically a really close to about what we need, maybe just under that. But a lot of times I've had people to bring in, uh, basically it looked like a teacup full of soil or less. And we're, we can't really make a, uh, a really good uh, test on that at the, at the soil lab. So we asked for a quart. So if you're doing this, and you're taking it to your county extension office, if you mix it up, if you've got a gallon, that's fine. Take them, take them the gallon. If you've got a quart, take them the quart. But make sure there's at least a quart of dried soil. <clears throat> so some information are needed. But, you know, we're wanting your name, address, uh, that sort of thing. That way we can get it back to you. We're wanting to know what it is. You're gonna mark other for a uh, uh, food plot, that sort of thing. And we're gonna run a routine buffer, uh, pH and the MP and K. It's gonna give you also the calcium, uh, magnesium and the zinc. Uh, we're gonna mark uh, either a new planting or plant maintenance if you're already growing one, whether it's sunny or shady. Then these samples are gonna be packaged up by us uh, at the extension office and we're gonna send it off. Like I said, it's gonna take about a week and a half to get it back. Uh, once we get that back, what we're gonna do is we're gonna uh, mail it out to you, email it out to you, whatever uh, uh, basically works uh, for you all and uh, uh, whatever you put down and then we'll go from there. So any questions? If you have any questions, you can unmute or type in your chat pod or we can even wait to the end, uh, if need be, but uh, that's pretty much uh, uh, the gist of it. So. Uh, what I'll do is I've stopped sharing my screen. So I'm gonna go ahead and uh, stop my video and turn it over to Shad for the nitty gritty about uh, what to plant, when to plant, that sort of thing. Okay, is everybody seeing that? Give me a thumbs up if you're seeing that. All right, good deal. Apologize for the sound effects. I forgot those were on there. Um, so it's really important uh, when you're thinking about food plots to match the uh, plants that you're gonna grow to the soils that you have. And Jeremy spoke to you about how to amend the soils to get them up to where they needed to be, uh, but, um, 
that's true from a fertility standpoint, but in particular, I'm thinking about the soil type and uh, what will thrive in the soil type that you have. So if you're trying to uh, grow clover on a strip mine site, um, you're gonna be uh, uh, kicking against the goad, so to speak. Uh, that, that's a little bit uh, hard to pull off. So you have to match uh, the, the site that you have to the plants that you're trying to grow. You need to ask, how much sunlight does it get? So I've seen people that have uh, a lot of times around uh, in the region, people try to grow a food plot uh, in a place that's too shady. They've got a, a little quarter acre uh, opening in the middle of the woods and they think that they can uh, sow that down in a food plot and they will have a, a good thing to, to shoot a deer from uh, come deer season. And it's just too shady. Um, and not every food plot mix is well suited to every site, regardless of what that packaging says. And uh, if you uh, like to hunt, or if you are a, uh, a wildlife enthusiast, I know you've seen uh, some of the advertisements for the, uh, uh, you know, the Imperial Whitetail and uh, some of the others that will claim that they can, you can just uh, throw it down on the ground uh, and it will sprout. And <laughs> Um, you know, if it sounds too good to be true, it probably is. Uh, there's always going to be uh, soil preparation and uh, that's necessary. Uh, otherwise, it, it doesn't uh, last. So uh, just make sure that you're matching the mix that you're trying to grow to the location. Uh, so the, there's a question, and, and Phil, this comes up in that UT uh, publication about to grass or not to grass. And uh, a lot of people plant grass because it's nice and green. It comes up really fast and they feel like that, uh, well, surely those, those animals will eat that. And um, they, they did uh, research that if you use that UT publication, you will see that overwhelmingly uh, the forage that the, the wildlife was most likely to utilize was the legumes and the grasses were not heavily utilized. I'm not saying they weren't used at all, but uh, it was not a preferred thing. If you've got a, a, a sloped location, that grass can serve a, a secondary purpose of stabilizing the, the slope, but uh, UT's pub tells you that if there's less than two to 3% grade, uh, you can drop the grass out of the mix and, and uh, not be any worse off. And it, regardless of what you do, those legumes uh, should be used as much as possible. Um, they, the, the protein levels that are from the legumes are much more beneficial to the wildlife uh, than what they're gonna get out of the, the grasses. And not, keep in mind, not every field is flat. Um, most of us that live here in the mountains know that uh, some of our fields are, are flat, but they just lay on a 20% grade. And, <laughs> uh, uh, just keep in mind that you don't want to do anything that's going to lose uh, your topsoil. So uh, anything that's over 3% uh, grass is going to play an important role in uh, preventing the erosion uh, and, and you don't want to lose your topsoil. Uh, no food plot is going to be worth that. So uh, you don't want to try something that's got a two to three year benefit, but you're going to cause a, a, a 300 year loss of topsoil. So uh, don't do that at the risk of sounding like the governor, don't do that. Um, so select a high quality seed from an adapted variety. And so you can get publications. I, I know UK has them. I'm assuming that UT has the, or uh, Virginia Tech, I apologize, uh, has these as well. Uh, but they will have different uh, strains of clovers, uh, red clover, white clover, uh, orchard grass, all these different things. And they will uh, tell you from their research plots uh, what the germination rate has been. Um, usually uh, you'll get some indication of what the purity is on the, the tag, uh, but that's also in the, the research. And uh, so uh, that matters. Um, if you just go down uh, to the local farm supply and get whatever they've got in the bin, that may or may not be uh, the best adapted variety to where you live. And you might be getting something um, that is a 30 or 40 year old variety that, uh, you know, it's kind of like buying Silver Queen sweet corn. 
Um, it was really popular and, and it, it is still decent, but we've got some that are way better than that. And the same thing is true with these forages. We've got varieties that have been greatly improved. They produce a lot more uh, uh, feed, better germination, better disease control, all these things. So uh, you definitely want to take the time to research uh, the varieties that are, that are uh, the top performers. So uh, when you buy that high dollar mix, uh, uh, you're going to be getting a better performing food plot though, right? And uh, that's not necessarily true. Um, when you buy these, uh, and I, I'm going to try to uh, not name anybody by name, but uh, a lot of catalogs or uh, magazines will refer you to uh, these blends for wildlife. And uh, a lot of times what you're paying for is the advertisements. You're not necessarily paying for the results. And so, um, well, I will name one. Like my, my dad is huge on this biologic. And uh, they think that if you put in a biologic food plot, that, that that's the best. And they believe that because they've seen it in uh, deer hunting magazines over and over for the last 20 years. And uh, whether or not that's the best suited to Kentucky or to Southwest Virginia is highly questionable. So uh, just keep that in mind. Um, don't, don't think about those slick varieties. Go with the, the variety trials and, and pick one that is uh, suited. So this is just an example of uh, uh, two different varieties and the differences. Uh, you know, you could see the Ozark there on the left. It was a little bit spotty, so there were germination issues. And uh, it's growing decent, but uh, there's a lot of openings uh, for weeds in that. If you look at the one on the right, you can see they got a real good uh, germination and a good solid stand. And I know this is grass that we're talking about here, but, but the example applies to clover. It applies to, uh, you know, alfalfa. Uh, bird's foot tree full, uh, you name it. All, all the different things that, that you might consider. So different forages have different fertility requirements. And uh, uh, Jeremy hit on this a lot uh, on how to uh, amend those and what to do. But, uh, you know, some are more finicky than others. And uh, so don't think that it's a one size fits all on the, uh, the fertility requirements. And you can't tell uh, just by looking uh, whether the soil is rich or not. Uh, you have to test it. And uh, you know, any ag agent will tell you over and over again, people think that by looking at it, uh, that they can tell if it's fertile or not. And a lot of times they'll say if it's black, it's fertile, and if it's uh, brown or gray, that it, it's not. And uh, that's, you can't tell by looking at it. The closest you can come to tell from looking is how well the weeds are growing on it. And uh, you know, if you've got a gigantic stand of weeds, uh, you, you might have some indication that that's a, a fertile place, but otherwise uh, you, you can't tell by the soil itself. So when you're preparing that seabed, make sure that you incorporate that lime. You can't just put this down on the surface. It needs to be worked in. Uh, you need to make sure that you've killed out all the competing weeds and other vegetation. Clover, uh, as good as it is for wildlife, it is notorious for being a poor competitor. Uh, you cannot seed clover into an existing stand of fescue or uh, cerisa or uh, you know some of these other things and just expect that it's going to compete. It will not. It'll be choked out and uh, you will have wasted a lot of time and, and sweat and money. So uh, you need to prepare the, the seed bed and it's got to be in direct contact with the soil. I uh, don't think that you can just go through and weed eat the weeds down and throw the, the seed in and that it'll, it'll catch up. Uh, it doesn't work that way. That, that seed needs to be in direct contact with the soil. Uh, if it's not, it'll germinate, but uh, it'll die as soon as the weather dries. Uh, today is a great example. We've had all that cool wet weather and today it was very sunny and the relative humidity humidity at my house was like 20 percent uh, which is very dry and uh, you know if you had a seed that germinated yesterday and then you have a day like today uh, that little uh, root 
tip that's coming out of the seed is going to shrivel up. And uh, so you, you need to get it where it can get into the ground quickly. So uh, that may mean plowing the field, but it doesn't necessarily mean plowing the field. It can be as simple as just uh, applying a burn down uh, uh, herbicide and then disking. And in fact, that would be uh, my preferred uh, way of doing it would be uh, to kill it with, with Roundup or something and then to come in and, and disk it uh, or rough it up a little bit. Uh, you don't have to take a, a, a mold bore plow to it or a rototiller to it. Uh, just enough to, to get, uh, get it opened up a little bit. And if you've got access to a cultipacker, if you do go to the trouble of, of tilling and things, that cultipacker will help for, uh, produce the little uh, ridges that the seed can get down in there, but it, it stabilizes the soil so that the seed doesn't get buried too deep if it rains. If, if you've never seen a clover seed, it is very, very tiny. And uh, the biggest mistake that people often make is uh, they go too deep with it. And uh, in particular with uh, uh, clover, it, it, you're talking about like an eighth to a quarter of an inch. Um, if you don't have access to all those fancy uh, pieces of equipment, you can use uh, uh, an ATV uh, with some of the little uh, implements that they have. Sometimes you can uh, rent those. I don't know if Southwest uh, Tool Rental over in uh, uh, Norton, if they do farm implements or not. I've never uh, tried farm implements, but uh, but I know they've got a lot of other things. And um, so uh, another thing is if you do uh, plow, uh, if you have uh, done a shallow plowing, uh, a lot of times what will happen is the roots will go down to wherever that plow layer layer is and they won't go any deeper. You, you kind of create a hard pan that the roots can't penetrate. So you're gonna to have to be familiar with, with your soil uh, a little bit to determine whether or not you've got uh, a place that uh, can handle that or not. As far as uh, will, will it create a pan or not. If you've got a river bottom, if it's sandy, you don't have to worry about that usually. But if you've got a, a, a lot of clay or, or a, a lot of rock in there, that becomes an issue. Uh, you might need to consider pre-inoculating your clover seed. And uh, what you're doing is you're adding the bacteria that allow those clovers to fix nitrogen out of the air and into the soil. And it's gonna benefit the clover and the, the surrounding plants and it's gonna uh, spare you the expense of, of adding nitrogen fertilized. If you don't do that, a lot of times it, it doesn't perform very well. And uh, UK's got a publication, uh, AGR90, that will tell you uh, how to go about inoculating your clover seed. Some, some of the blends come with the, the seed already inoculated, uh, but it's just kind of hit or miss. So you, you're gonna have to read that on the bag. Um, so use uh, the, the proper seeding methods. And uh, as you look at some of these, um, publications that we have. Jeremy, I don't know if you're going to have it. Uh, I know the UT pub goes into it, but there's one on uh, uh, forage renovation, renovating uh, fields, pastures and fields. And it will tell you what the seeding depth needs to be depending on what uh, plant that you're going to try to grow. And uh, so, and it's really, really, really important that you not, uh, not over uh, plow, you know, that you're not sowing the seed too deep. The other issue is when to do it. Um, some things establish better in the fall than they do in the spring. Uh, right now is actually uh, past the time for establishing uh, clover. So if you tried to sow clover right now, it's not that it wouldn't come up. It may come up. It may even start off looking really good. But when we get into June and July, uh, the roots haven't had time to get very deep. And if we have hot, dry weather set in, uh, which we often do, you may see a total failure of that clover crop in the middle of the summer. And so some of them, you're better off establishing them uh, in the, the fall. And usually for a lot of these, that's August and September. 
uh, is when you would establish uh, uh, some of these and it, it allows the, the seed will lay dormant until some of those fall rains come in and then it lets the, the plant get established through the winter uh, so that it, it's getting the roots down in the ground deep all winter long before the, the summer comes along. Um, one of the gripes to the spring as well is that it's often too wet to work in the spring and you don't have that problem in August and September. Uh, so just keep that in mind. Uh, fall is uh, again, a lot of times there's fewer weeds and uh, um, th there can be issues with moisture if it happens to, to turn off too dry. Uh, two years ago, we tried to establish a food plot here at the office, and that's what's in the, the picture uh, that's coming up. Um, and we, we got really good establishment uh, early on. You can kind of see that light green in the background. And uh, then the weather turned off to totally, utterly dry. And uh, we lost uh, everything. So fall is not the end all be all. Uh, you can have problems then too, but just um, recognize it if it happens. Uh, if, if you have a, a failure in the fall, try again in the spring and uh, keep trying it until you get that, uh, that establishment. There are some pests that you need to know about uh, that, that can be issues and uh, especially if it's alfalfa. Uh, weeds obviously are going to compete uh, and th all these can lead to, to poor stands. And uh, some of this can mean that you have to apply selective herbicides to try to keep the, the weeds down. And uh, a lot of it's management. Uh, clover in particular uh, uh, likes to, uh, to be in a field that's mowed. And if you uh, leave it fallow all year long, uh, your grasses in particular are gonna come up and choke out the clover. So, Maintaining clover in a stand is uh, a pretty largely dictated by how you've managed it and, and if you uh, mowed it occasionally. And we've got a publication, AGR 148, that will uh, talk about some of that stuff. Um, I'm just gonna go through some of these really quickly. Uh, Jeremy gave you seven as kind of the, uh, the base level and that's a good uh, generic uh, level for, for most things. Some of these like it to be just a little bit lower than that, than that seven. Um, most things that we grow uh, prefer it to be around six and a half, and uh, th that's really close to seven, uh, but this just gives you the seeding rates of eight to 12 pounds per acre, and if you're gonna do it as a mix, six to nine pounds uh, if you're doing it with grass. And Pay attention to the fact that it says that the seeding will be productive for two to three years if managed well. So uh, I look at some of our pastures in uh, Letcher County, and, and I know we're talking about food plots, but it's very similar to, to pasture land. Um, they think that because they put clover in it 12 years ago, that the clover's still there. And uh, it doesn't work that way. If you've done a really good job, uh, you can uh, get five years sometimes. I've even heard of eight, but usually the productive level is two to three. And so uh, uh, don't, don't, uh, um, don't get hung up thinking that this is a one and done deal, because it's not. Um, I'm just gonna skip through some of this, get to the, the white clover likes it around 6.4. Again, best established in, in February to mid-April. And uh, you do still have time, if you went and did it right now, you would still have time to get that clover going. And if it failed, you could try again in the spring. Uh, but uh, you can get about three to four years out of white clover. There are different kinds of white clover. There's the small white clover that's known as Dutch. Uh, we've also got the common clover and then the uh, Ladino. Uh, uh, this is what the imperial uh, whitetail clover is as well. Uh, but usually that uh, Ladino is a lot larger and it produces three to five times as much growth as Dutch. So obviously if you're trying to uh, do it for wildlife, this is something that you would uh, favor. Um, you're gonna get a lot more uh, forage out of that. Um, 
Regal Ladino seed is widely available and does the best. Uh, you can also uh, mix them and uh, that can be good. Um, but the, the, if you do mixtures, uh, they can be more expensive and they've not shown to, to uh, do any better than a single variety. And the reason I'm pointing that out is because some people, uh, a lot of the wildlife blends, uh, they will sell it to you because they'll say, oh, we've got all these different varieties in here. And, and uh, if one fails, you've still got another. And uh, uh, the research doesn't back that claim up. Some other things that you might want to think about for uh, wildlife is chicory. And uh, this is something that you uh, have probably seen growing along the side of the highway. Some people call it uh, blue-eyed sailors. It's the little blue flower that's about the size of a, a quarter. And the variety that you'll see on the side of the road will be the very stemmy kind. So you'll see, you know, two, three foot tall stems with the little blue flowers on it. This particular version of chicory uh, is a forage chicory. So it's got a lot more leaf material and a lot less stem. You know, wildlife doesn't like stems. It, it likes the, uh, the leaf material. And uh, the gripe to it is, is expensive, uh, but it does really well on poor droughty sites. So if you're talking about a, a strip mine location, this may be the way to go. Uh, winter wheat is also really good because it's cheap uh, and it establishes quickly, but uh, you know, it, it doesn't last very long. You basically got six months out of it and it's gone. So uh, there are drawbacks to it. Buckwheat is a good one. Uh, it's obviously good for uh, bees and things, but it comes up quickly. It's a great fall plot. So if you're uh, wanting to do things for deer, uh, this is a great thing for bow hunting. Um, the, the gripe to it is again, it's like the winter weed, it's short lived, uh, but it does tolerate poor sites. And so, and they love it. If you plant buckwheat, uh, deer will come in a lot of times in Turkey and it'll look like a, a mower has gone in and, and mowed it off. They just, they really like buckwheat. Uh, bird's foot trefoil is a popular legume, uh, but it is outrageously expensive. You'll usually see the, the folks that, that do this ha either have deep pockets or it's the state uh, using taxpayer money. Uh, it's usually too expensive for most people to, to sow for food plots, but it does do very well on poor droughty sites. Uh, it's a little hard to get established, uh, but after it's established, it does really, really well. Um, we had uh, a spot uh, up at Pound Gap that had bird's foot trefoil in it, and this stuff, after it's growing, it will grow almost on, uh, on rock uh, in a gravel pile. So uh, it, it is really good after it gets going. Again, AGR 18 has the seeding dates, rates, and depths and uh, that can be really useful to you. And uh, as far as why all the fuss, uh, it, it can determine what you see and for how long you see it. And uh, food plots are especially beneficial in years that we have a total mass failure. And so, uh, you know, there are a lot of years that we have a, a late killing freeze that wipes out the oak uh, blooms and there's not a lot of acorn uh, or other mass that year. And uh, in those years, if you don't have a food plot nearby, you, you might not see any wildlife at all. And so it, it's really important to, to get them through. And I've just got uh, some pictures of things you might see if you're lucky. I'm assuming you've got elk uh, in your part of Virginia too. So are there any questions? Okay. How would soybeans do? Soybeans are great as a, um, uh, it's kind of a short lived deal, just like the, uh, the winter wheat and the buckwheat. Uh, deer and turkey both love the soybeans. And, uh, you know, I used to hunt over it down at Land Between the Lakes, and, and the deer would just stay out in those fields. Um, you know, it, it, uh, it's a bigger seed, so the establishment for it is a little. Uh, more in depth, you, you probably will have to work the soil a little better to get a, a thick stand of soybean than you would with clover or something. But other than that, uh, it, that's a good one. When should it be planted? 
soybean, there's all different kinds of soybeans. There's, uh, it's different groups and uh, you can buy soybeans that are um, kind of a long season bean and a short season bean. And mm -hmm. those short season beans come up really quickly. And um, uh, I'm an agronomy major, but that's been uh, 20 some years ago. And I, back then I could tell you what, uh, which group was which, but uh, if you don't uh, use it, you lose it. So um, probably uh, um, I, I'm going to say that it, it's going to take about a, a month to get a good stand of soybeans from the time that you uh, you, you plant it, to the, you start to see it canopy over. And uh, so you'll have to decide uh, when you want to plant that. I know uh, some places they do it in a rotation and uh, you can establish one in the spring and you can do it again in the fall. And uh, we can get you more information on that if you're interested. Any others? Okay. Emerson, I'm gonna hand it over to you. I'm gonna stop my share and let you take the wheel. All righty, can everybody see this? Yep, all right, good. Um, let me see. If you don't mind, can I add something real fast about the soil testing that you were talking about earlier? Um, one thing with NRCS, when a lot of people come into their office, this is the time of year that I see clients coming in who are wanting soil testing forms and boxes. And one of the questions on there asks for like what type of soil you have or what the soil map unit is. Um, and that's something that your local NRCS office can help you with or can provide for you. Uh, if you just let us know um, and look that up for you. There's also a website called Web Soil Survey and you can go online, you can find, type in your address or if you know your Latin long coordinates, you can plug that in and it'll take you there and you can get your soil, um, soil type there as well to add to that form. Um, but again, that is something that NRCS um, can assist you with as well if, if you need that. Um, I need to see if I can make sense. There we go. All right, so again, my name is Emerson Kirby and I'm a soil conservationist in Lebanon, Virginia um, for NRCS, which is Natural Resources Conservation Service. And we cover Buchanan, Dickinson, Russell, and Wise counties. Um, so a lot of this stuff's gonna be geared towards Virginia, but um, with Kentucky being as close as it is to us, um, a lot of these things are going to apply as well. So the first thing I wanna to talk to you guys about is pollinator habitat. Used to, we had an actual practice to establish pollinator habitat. However, now as time has evolved and time has gone on, um, it's gonna be a combination of several different practices and I'll list those practices um, throughout this presentation. But the goal of this is going to be established the appropriate plant community to support pollinator species. The photo on the left is kind of one of the things that we're getting at geared towards bees and butterflies um, for a pollinator species. The other two pictures were taken here in Russell County. The middle one is a monarch caterpillar on a milkweed plant. And then I'm not sure the insect on the right hand photo, um, but that is on a butterfly milkweed um, as well. Um, so one of the practices that we have, and I guess I'll back up. With NRCS, our flagship program is the EQIP program, and that stands for Environmental Quality Incentive Program. And it is a federally taxpayer funded program. Um, you have to have a farm and a track number registered with the Farm Service Agency and a couple of other eligibility things taken care of to apply for our program. Um, you can fill out an application all throughout the year. We typically have a ranking period in the fall. Um, this year it was in the spring due to a couple of things with funding. And then we have a ranking period where you compete against everyone in the state with your application to get funded. And then if you get funded, then your contract goes into, um, your application goes into a contract. And this is again cost share, so we help offset the cost of some of the practices. Their stuff is tied to water quality and the Clean Water Act. So a lot of their things are gonna deal with excluding livestock from um, surface waters. If it is a strictly wildlife related program, and isn't gonna involve any livestock or livestock exclusion, um, we'll refer you to Andy Rosenberger, and I've got his contact information at the end of this presentation. And he is our private lands biologist. So wildlife habitat management, wildlife habitat creation, and pretty much anything dealing with wildlife is uh, what Andy works with in his program. 
um, and then I mainly work with their EQIP program. But um, upland wildlife habitat management, that practice is where we're going to provide and manage upland habitats and connectivity within the landscape for wildlife. So our goal here is to enhance shelter, cover, and food for the target species. And then reapplication of this practice is gonna happen at intervals greater than three years. And that's just so that we can go in and maintain that habitat and keep it from becoming um, you know, a patch of invasives like autumn olive or to keep it from growing up into a cedar thicket or into like a mature forest. Um, as with all of our wildlife programs, um, we're gonna have two caveats that a lot of people don't like, but as far as wildlife, it's necessary. And that is um, the primary nesting season, April 15th to August 15th. And that's when we're gonna limit equipment travel, any grazing or haying that takes place in that area, as well as any other disturbances to the habitat. Um, we're going to minimize that between that primary nesting season. Also, we're going to regulate noxious weeds and um, control invasive weeds, invasive weeds to the best of our ability. We have early successional habitat development and management. Um, this is a good program or a good practice on a lot of our reclaimed strip mine, especially Wise and Dickinson counties. Um, and we're going to manage plant succession to develop and maintain early successional habitat to the benefit desire for the wildlife and or natural community that we want to establish. Um, we're going to provide habitat for species requiring early successional habitat for all or part of their life cycle. So an example of that would be the monarch butterfly that kind of likes these weedy patches of milkweed in order for it to lay its eggs on you're also going to have these wildflowers and forbs and stuff all around for the adult butterflies to feed on. And then an example of a bird is going to be the woodcock and they require a varied landscape as far as its life cycle is concerned. It's going to want this early successional habitat for foraging, for looking for food. It's going to want to raise its young in some of the brushier areas and then it wants like a mature forest you know, for it to, to live and reproduce in. Um, and again, equipment haying, grazing, and other disturbances will be limited during the primary nesting season of April 15th to August 15th, and we're going to control noxious and invasive weeds uh, with this practice as well. And then here's just a photo. I apologize for it being kind of grainy and hard to see what's going on. The bigger I made it, the worse it got. But this is an example of early successional habitat. You can see mature forests here in the background, and then here in the front you can see we've got like some Lespedeza, maybe some ironweed and stickweed, a little bit of chicory. We've got some legumes like clover and some other forbs. And then you've got a couple patches with maybe some multiflora rosebush, which we're gonna wanna control. But then you're gonna have your other kind of shrubby bushes, uh, maybe some elderberries or some uh, mulberries and little patches here and there of some larger stuff. But you wanna keep it like this, either through mowing, um, prescribed burning um, over time. And what they typically plan is if you have 10 acres, you may have three acres in wood, you may have three acres in something a little more like this shrubby area, and then three acres in this, this smaller area here where you've got your, your lower lying grasses and forbs and things like that. So it's gonna be kind of a successional habitat where you've got a little bit of everything, but the primary goal for this one is gonna maintain something that we have here in the foreground. We have something with a field border and that's going to be a strip of permanent vegetation around the edge of a field or the perimeter of a field and its goal is going to be to reduce erosion from wind and water and reduce excessive sediments from entering our surface waters as a result of soil erosion. Um, provide food and cover for wildlife and pollinators or other beneficial organisms so it would help address inadequate habitat for fish and other aquatic wildlife and organisms. And it's going to establish site or site adapted species of permanent grasses, forbs, or shrubs that um, accomplish this design objective. And it's going to be a minimum of 35 feet in width, depending on the soil type, the slope leading to it, the area of the watershed, it may be a little bit wider than 35 feet, but 35 would be the minimum. Um, and that's from our standard. And again, we're going to minimize any type of disturbance during April 15th to August 15th, as well as control invasive weeds um, as well. And then here's an example. Again, I apologize for the quality of these photos. Here you've got a lot of wildflowers. You've got some forbs, some little sunflowers, black-eyed Susans, goldenrod. To the right, you have a mature forest or what looks kind of like a mature forest. And then to the left is a cornfield. So you have this nice transition area from cornfield to field border with plenty of things for 
know, quail and grouse and um, your pollinator species, your butterflies, your bees, things like that. It's aesthetically pleasing, um, but it's also a buffet for wildlife. And it's just a nice transition area from what we would call a food desert over here in the cornfield. There's really not anything for our pollinators, um, for a lot of our wildlife species, except for maybe deer to kind of go through and eat some of that corn. So it's just a nice transition area um, from for all different types of wildlife here. Then we have forest stand improvement, and it's gonna be the manipulation of species composition, the structure of the stand or stand density by either cutting or killing selected trees or understory vegetation to achieve a desired forest condition or to obtain ecosystem services um, that you want on your property. And it's going to improve and sustain forest health and productivity. We're gonna initiate forest stand regeneration reduce damage from pests as well as moisture stress, restore or maintain natural plant communities, and improve wildlife and pollinator habitat. And again, like with all the other ones, April 15th to August 15th, we're gonna minimize disturbance as well as control noxious and invasive weeds. And here's an example of forest stain improvement. This dark shadowy area is a lot of undergrowth and brush, a lot of cedar trees. So you can see what it looked like before, and then the bottom picture is taken at the same location after they've gone through and cleared a lot of these um, smaller trees, brushy species, and now you've got just a big kind of oak savanna. And then once we start getting some rain and spring comes along, you're gonna get a lot of um, understory growth, a lot of your grasses and your forbs, your legumes and things like that are gonna come up. More sunlight's gonna reach the bottom. You're not gonna have all this overshading from the brushy species. You're still gonna have some shade from the oak trees, but you're gonna have just a much more open canopy. Wildlife's gonna be able to move freely through here and not have to worry about weaving its way in and out of all the thickets and stuff. So you're just gonna have an overall better, better environment. Um, also, for anybody that does any hunting, you've got a better line of sight going through here than you do um, up through here as well. And then we have riparian forest buffers. Uh, most of our equip contracts have this in them as well. Um, it's an area that's going to be predominantly trees or shrubs located adjacent to or up gradient from water. Uh, we're going to create shade to lower or maintain water temperatures to improve habitat for your aquatic organisms, a lot of your fish and stuff. The cooler the water is, the more dissolved oxygen that water is going to be able to hold. The warmer the water, the less oxygen, so we want to keep that water as oxygenated as possible for fish health and other aquatic organisms. We're going to create and improve Riparian habitat that's gonna provide a source of detritus or large um, logs, leaves, and finer, smaller woody debris for other aquatic organisms like snails to feed on, and also your helgramites, your caddisfly larva, mayfly larva, things like that to live in. And really that's gonna help build up the whole food chain and food web in that stream or body of water because you're gonna have a lot more places for these organisms to hide. They're gonna be able to reproduce. Um, that's gonna increase their numbers and then you're going to have more food for your fish. Your fish are going to get larger because they're going to have a have a larger um, food chain, food web to prey upon. And then we're also going to reduce sediment entering surface water so you're not going to have a lot of sedimentation. That buffer is going to help catch that sediment and keep it up on land and not come into the water and cover up anything that's living on the bottom of the stream. It's also going to help filter out excess nutrients as well as fertilizers or pesticides. Um, keeping those excess nutrients out is going to reduce any type of algae bloom or something like that, which is going to be detrimental to fish health. And again, in the riparian forest buffer, equipment and stuff like that is going to be minimized during April 15th and August 15th, as well as controlling noxious weeds and invasive plants. And then here's a really nice example. You've got a stream coming down through here. Originally, it was just a stream going through some pasture or hay field. There's really nothing around it, so we went in and we planted trees along either side a 35 foot wide buffer on either side. Typically it's 300 trees per acre. Um, DOF or Virginia Department of Forestry, uh, they write the forestry plans and they inspect everything and then they give us the go ahead to uh, pay on these practices. Typically they're recommending nut bearing hardwoods for wildlife purposes, um, for squirrel and turkey and deer. So you're gonna see a lot of oak and walnut. But if there's something else you want planted in there, a lot of times they'll work with you to put in some common apples, maybe some um, pear trees just you kind of have to work with them to kind of get what you want in there. So then you've, on the bottom right, you've got a stream that after it's been fenced off for a while, you've got your rushes, your sedges, your reeds coming up along the wetter areas of the stream. Then as you go further back, you start getting into kind of what would be like a successional habitat. You've got your smaller plants, and then as you go back, you're getting into some willows, some other large trees as well. 
and then you've got some other little plants in there, um, ironweed, stickweed, riverweed, things like that as well. They're going to provide food for our pollinators as well as seeds for other um, birds and things like that as well. And then we have the Golden Wing Warbler Initiative or Program, and that's where habitat's going to be restored for the Golden Wing Warbler. That's also going to benefit many other species, including songbirds like your indigo buntings, your gray catbirds, prairie warblers, as well as um, game species like the American woodcock, cottontails, turkey, deer, and grouse. Practices like those listed previously throughout the presentation are used to help create this habitat for the Golden Wing Warbler um, program. And it's interesting to note that 80% of the forest land that makes up the nesting habitat for the Golden Wing Warbler in Appalachia is privately owned. And then share available to help create this habitat through the um, previously listed practices. And that is something that Andy Rosenberger um, would help you with as well. And then here's just a picture of a Golden Wing Warbler. And I think he or she kind of reflects how we all feel right now being in self-isolation and quarantine. I'm starting to get a little stir crazy. And then we have a quail recovery program and I just kind of learned about it today. Um, and it's a partnership between the Department of Forestry and the Virginia Department of Game and Inland Fisheries. Um, Andy Rosenberger would be the point of contact. His name is here and his area is the reddish pink area of Southwest Virginia. Right now, just Bland and Wythe counties in Southwest Virginia are where they're doing this program. Um, the other 13 counties are highlighted in red across the state. Um, I didn't know where everybody would be from today. And what they're going to do is help manage woody vegetation. They're going to help thin it with, um, or vegetation in thin forest land with legume friendly herbicides. So they're going to want to try to apply something that's not going to wipe out our legumes. Commercial thinning of small acreage stands, the establishment of native pine stands, so your longleaf pine and shortleaf pine, as well as pre commercial thinning and then prescribed burning. Um, and again, that would be something to contact Andy Rosenberger with for Southwest Virginia. And I'll have all of the contact information at the end of this presentation as well. Nope, oh, here we are. So here is the contact information that I've got myself and Wes Stanley. Wes is the district conservationist for our service center and I'm the soil conservationist. Uh, we cover Buchanan, Dickinson, Russell and Wise counties. Anybody's in Tazel County, Greg Mead is the district conservationist there. And there's his contact information. And then Washington County, Bill Moss is the district conservationist there. We have his uh, contact information. And then as we get further down into Southwest Virginia, I've got Scott County with Mark Jesse. He's the district conservationist. And Jordan Southern, he is new to Lee County. Um, he started in the fall, winter of last year. There is his contact information. And then Andy Rosenberger's information is our private lands biologist. Um, his information is there. Um, does anybody have any questions? I wanna try to figure out how to come back here. No any, questions. Any questions for Emerson or Shad or myself? This is Jeremy. Uh, one of the things that I did is uh, that food plot publication that uh, Shad talked about. Um, put that over in the, the chat pod. So you need to save that or uh, jot that down. Uh, you can copy and paste it over into a web browser uh, and check that out. Um, Bill, do you have anything to add? I don't. Um... Other than um, with the soil testing in Virginia, it's a little bit different. They used to bring it to the extension office, but now it's requested by Blacksburg that they send it directly to the lab. But we do have the boxes and the forms and we can get them the information on that. And um, the prices range from if it's a garden or food plot or something that's non-commercial, it's $10 fee. If it's commercial, and we're pretty loose with how that's defined, it, it is for free uh, other than the shipping cost. So, sounds good, sounds good, definitely. So basically they st probably still need to get in touch with you for the, uh, just the shipping material and that sort of thing, or if they've got any questions. Right. Okay, sounds good. 
And uh, great information there by Emerson and uh, for the Kentucky side uh, of, uh, of the line, uh, Kentucky Department of Fish and Wildlife has a habitat improvement program as well. Uh, you can work with NRCS, but you can also work with the Kentucky Department of Fish and Wildlife. Both of those programs are great. I presume the Virginia Department of Game and Inland Fisheries also has a program. Uh, you might be able to check with both uh, to see what's going on. I know uh, on the Kentucky side of things, I know Shad's uncle, uh, you may want to talk a little bit about uh, what your uncle Rodney did. Uh, he, I know he did some wildlife habitat that worked out pretty well on his place. He's done the equip and the, uh, I think Kip is one of them. There, there's several uh, that he's done. Uh, he's done the uh, timber stand improvement uh, where they do the hack and spray that opens up the, uh, the forest uh, floor and uh, some of the, the blueberries and uh, viburnums and things kind of come back in and that benefits the wildlife. And he's done the pollinator establishment. Um, he's done most of the things that uh, Emerson talked about. So, and, and we've seen a, a, a noticeable increase in uh, sightings of, of wildlife and, and that would be game and non-game. So a lot more uh, songbirds, uh, just big improvements. So right there, you got that. Uh, I, I, don't, I don't remember if you covered it or not, Shad, but I know uh, I will add that, uh, you know, these food plots are not the be all end all. Uh, they, uh, they do great. Uh, they will draw in wildlife, but uh, I have I've heard from people that uh, uh, when you don't have years that there's not a lot of hard mass, say acorns, uh, it, it's great. Food plots are great, but once those acorns start to drop, they will leave those food plots. Uh, it's kind of like uh, uh, steak versus hamburger, or uh, uh, you know, it's uh, that that uh, acorns are kind of like those, uh, kind of like sugar, and so they head to those to put on fat for the winter. So. You they're may gonna go about your food plots. They're, they're, gonna, they're gonna go where the calories are. Exactly. Exactly. More calories in those acorns than there are in the, the proteins of the clovers. Exactly. Anybody got any questions? All right. Uh, sounds good. Uh, tomorrow night we've got uh, pesticides and bees. Uh, and uh, Dr. Rick Besson from the University of Kentucky will be joining us. So hopefully you'll be back. Uh, tell everybody about this, uh, you know, uh, share it on your Facebook pages, whatever, uh, let people know about what's going on. Glad to have everybody and uh, hopefully you'll join us uh, tomorrow night. But uh, thank you for tuning in tonight. We really appreciate y'all. Thanks for having me. I appreciate it. Thank you. Yes, thank you, Emerson. We appreciate uh, you coming on and uh, giving that great information. Thanks so much. Everybody have a great evening. Two.